The news from the seat of war must thrill every loyal American heart with deep emotion. The trust reposed by the country in its heroic army has not been misplaced. After a battle of unparalleled severity in which our soldiers fought against great odds in regard to position, and against forces not much inferior, if at all, in point of numbers to their own, they have come off more than conquerors, not only driving the enemy from their formidable positions, but seizing all of their guns and equipments, and pausing only when the sheltered ranks of the rebels found safety after retreat in other and equally strong defenses. The entrenchments of the enemy at Bull's Run were believed to be quite as impregnable as those at Manassas. The distance between the places is only a few miles, and after the repulse of our reconteering regiments on Thursday, it is known that large reinforcements were sent forward by the rebels, and that they were exultant with the belief that their lines could not be forced. They had two days in which to make their defenses complete, and Beauregard's entire army, if not actually present, close behind them, from which to draw all of actual and all of strategic aid that their selected field was fitted to receive. That the rebels had chosen Bull's Run as a position they would maintain would seem to be evident both from its fitness, according to all descriptions for military defense, and from their reluctance to leave it. The fighting was terrific, we are told. The enemy contested every inch. They did not cease to wield their guns until every battery was taken and when they were finally expelled it must have been in all cases at the point of the bayonet, for all their guns and equipments were left in the hands of the victorious Union Army. It was a bloody expulsion from their breastworks and guns, and not a retreat from a field that could no longer be contested. We are aware that the public will have no care for editorial comments on this grand event. The occasion is too solemn, and the emotion it calls up too deep for the expression in any language that we can command. We can only bow in heartfelt gratitude to the God of battles that he has seconded our noble army and caused victory to rest with the eagles of the Union. Exaggeration played its usual trick with the news of Sunday's battle. In light of more detailed and authentic advices, it may fairly be considered doubtful whether either party has gained a victory, for while panic-stricken, our exposed forces left the field, it is clear that the enemy never quitted their entrenchments to occupy it. In fact, they appear to have been so much intimidated by the encounter as to pretermit the opportunity they undoubtedly possess to cut to pieces our retiring troops. This omission may be explained in two ways. In the fighting throughout the day, the national troops had exhibited every superiority of strength, tact, and courage, uniformly driving before them the enemy when he ventured beyond his defenses and even capturing three of his batteries in succession. Such exploits could not fail to fill the insurgent ranks with dread of the equal terms upon which they must stand were they to quit their lines, and indeed, after the prodigies of valor our fellows had displayed, they had every reason to believe the backward movement was a feint to decoy them from their almost impregnable works to ground where the conditions of the contest should be equalized. There is much reason also to believe that the enemy suffered and killed and wounded far more severely than the national forces. Testimony from a dozen independent sources is to this effect. They were thus probably in as bad a condition to pursue as our shattered columns were to fight. For by such arguments only can we account for the omission to follow the retreating army into Washington itself, and for the ability of our people to retrace their steps, as they subsequently did, and to recover guns and baggage which had been abandoned in the flight, and which an enemy, assured of victory, would have hastened to gather up. From this review of the business, we can only derive the impression that but for the reasonless panic which was communicated to our men, and the influence of which was favored by the broken and woody peculiarities of the country, which prevented any one regiment from knowing what had befallen its neighbor, the victory would have been ours, much more certainly than it can now be attributed to the enemy. Later information illustrates another important point. In this conflict, the rebels exerted and perhaps exhausted all the military energies at their command. 
Their army, which was recruited by conscriptions and impressments, represents perhaps as large a force as they could without the prestige of success bring to the field. While it was directed by the only commanders upon whose skill they are willing to stake their fortunes. President Davis was in charge of the main body, while Beauregard and Johnston commanded the wings. Thus we have encountered all the strength and skill they can muster with a tithe of our strength, and without the employment of any of the military talent upon which our soldiers have learned to rely. It is for this reason, and in connection with the excessive numbers and better position of the enemy, that we have come out of the conflict with no better result. The reflection is at once encouraging and instructive. If you'd like to learn more about the American Civil War, read a book. If you enjoyed today's video and would like to see more content like this, take a shot at the like button, subscribe, and click that notification bell to stay up to date with all the latest bird dog videos.